diversity, inclusion, equity. Are these just corporate buzzwords or are they initiatives making a difference in hiring, retention, and promotion? Well, we're about to find out. Our featured panelists will reveal the meaning behind that language and share ways you can best gain the advantage, whether you're an entrepreneur or a professional looking for a prime corporate assignment. So let's learn a little bit about our panelists. Our moderator is Joteka Edi, Vice President of Policy, Strategic Engagement, and M Impact for Lend Up, a financial technology company that provides loans and credit cards, as well as education and gamification to encourage responsible financial behavior. She represents a leading voice in social impact tech in connecting Silicon Valley and Washington, D.C. Joteka is joined by two equally experienced, impactful professionals, in the space, beginning with Damian Hooper Campbell, eBay's first chief diversity officer. Damian is responsible for leading the design and implementation of eBay's strategy for embedding DNI across its global workforce, workplace, and marketplace. Then last but not least, we have Ed Zabasasaja, Director of Data Analytics and Retention at Intel Core. Ed is responsible for Intel's global diversity and inclusion, inclusion data and analytics, plus retention and progression strategies across the enterprise. I hope y'all all got that. We're going to be doing a quiz on all. I'm just playing. We're not. We're not going to do a quiz. <laughs> so please welcome our panelists, Joteka, Damien, and Ed. Second. Oh. One moment. They told me, I forgot to make one small announcement. If you are in the back, please keep it down. We have to respect our panelists and the people back here, up here, who came to spend their beautiful and well-earned time with us. So again, if you feel like you have to make a lot of noise, please step out to the foyer. We won't mind. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to start over again. Here's your second opportunity. Hello. Oh. Hello, Tech Connect, are you here? Hello. So you know, uh, one thing, if you know me, if you follow me on social media, you know that I live vicariously through Oprah Winfrey, so never have me moderate a panel and be like, hello, everybody. Um, so I'm really excited about this conversation and really this dynamic panel. Um, and these two really extraordinary individuals. Um, so diversity and inclusion. So just by a show of, of those in the audience, how many of you have heard the word diversity? Let's just sort of cancel out today, because you just heard it. But how many of you have heard the word diversity and inclusion within the last week? All right, keep your hands up. How many of you have read an article about diversity and inclusion in the last week? How many of you had a conversation or been in a meeting in your company about diversity and inclusion? Yes. So diversity and inclusion, it's, 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 it's words that we're hearing. Uh, some would say they're buzzwords, um, but we're hearing these words a lot more than we have for many of us that have been in this industry for a long time. We, it is definitely two words that have really, really put themselves really in the center of the conversation. So I want to, you know, go over to this dynamic panel. Damien, who's here. I know the photos have Joteka, Damien, and Ed, but this is Damien, this is Ed. Um, so I want to start out with just asking diversity and inclusion. What does the word, both of those words, mean to you? What do they mean to your company, and what are you doing to create a more inclusive ecosystem? Cool. I'll start with you, Damien. Sure. Uh, first of all, peace, black enterprise. What's going on, y'all? Um, it's an honor to be here. Grew up reading this and uh, still read it, so it's an honor to be here. I mean, what does it mean? <clears throat> Look, I think y'all know what it means. We represent it. Everybody represents it. Um, the best definition I've ever heard of the word diversity is variance in people, mm. right? And that can mean a whole lot of things. A lot of times we confine it to just talking about gender or just talking about race. Uh, but it means a whole bunch of things. That's on the diversity side. 
On the inclusion side, it's like, all right, bet you have all of that variance in people. What in the hell are you actually going to do with it? Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of folks often think that diversity and inclusion just happens by hiring folks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We think you need to be much more intentional about that. It doesn't just happen organically by having a bunch of diverse folks show up to a workplace. You got to be more intentional around the inclusion side. And so what it means specifically uh, to eBay is it means survival. Right, like eBay doesn't thrive without diversity and inclusion. eBay doesn't decide to move into the next frontier of innovation unless we have a bunch of folks from a bunch of different backgrounds who actually feel comfortable bringing those backgrounds to bear in the workplace. Um, and so some of the things that we're really trying to do, so I won't really focus on the diversity side because I feel like a lot of this panel is about 2.0. Yes. Like is it more than just a buzzword? So everybody knows about you know, going to my alma mater, Morehouse College, and, and recruiting, and going HBCUs, to Spelman. And, you there know, are a lot of HBCUs. We people. know about that. Yes. I think where you're seeing a lot of companies focus their, their attention is on the inclusion side. And one of the things that we try to do, I'll just name a couple of quick ones and then pass it to my brother. But um, when we started this journey with my role uh, a couple of years ago, we said, look, inclusion isn't going to be about us forcing people and walking into a conversation and telling people, you have white privilege and therefore you better do this. That's not the way we were gonna approach this because we don't think that that actually works. Instead, we were gonna decide, why don't we try to meet folks where they are? Whether they're white, whether they're black, whether they're Hispanic, transgender, or whatever it may be, and bring people into the conversation and simply lock in on a point in time in their lives when people have felt excluded. Because that's one thing we all have in common. And then if we could get people to agree that they've all felt excluded, and to define what that feeling felt like, then we can bring in data and say, well, guess what? There's a whole bunch of people trying to get into this company mm -hmm. who are feeling the same way you felt as a 10-year-old when you didn't get picked for the kickball team. And so one of the ways we're doing that is by starting with a conversation. We're obviously looking at processes and procedures to make sure that um, you know, folks are being promoted in a way that is as free from bias as is possible. Um, but then one of the things I'm really proud of, and a couple of my team members in the audience who uh, produced this thing, late August, we created something called Courageous Conversations, mm. where we said a lot of companies right now don't want to talk about politics. They don't want to talk about religious differences. They don't want to talk about Me Too. They don't want to talk about race, and they don't want to talk about gender. We created these opt-in environments for our employees, whether you're Republican, whether you are Democrat, whether you are an independent, to actually come together in a facilitated fashion to learn from each other. With the goal being, you don't have to leave saying, I'm going to change my mind. But we think a lot of inclusion comes with education mm -hmm. and with people breaking down some of the myths and stereotypes that we as human beings put up. And so Courageous Conversations is actually built to run towards the sticky conversations that divide us in an effort to help us to understand each other a little bit better. So that's just a little bit of how we're trying to tackle inclusion at eBay. Thank you. So Ed, I want to go to you. Right. So um, you're with Intel, and I must put this plug in because your chief diversity officer is a Gamecock. Uh, I don't know if there are any Gamecocks in the audience. Probably not. I'll represent for USC. Um, but um, tell me a bit more about diversity and inclusion, what it means for you specifically, um, Damien raised an interesting point when he said for eBay is survival. Is, is that a similar philosophy at Intel? And, and what is your approach there? And what are, what are uh, some actual, um, uh, some actual um, diversity and inclusion initiatives that you put in place there? Yeah, so first of all, uh, very glad to be here. It's an honor always to be able to uh, congregate and be able to have uh, very nice and dynamic conversations around topics of this nature. So the first thing I'll say, I do agree with my brother Damien. Uh, survival is definitely an artifact of what diversity really is. And to take a, a step forward, it's really about uh, a seat at the table. Mm. Uh, too many times uh, we do have situations where uh, folks are watching the action from a distance or even excluded from the action. Mm -hmm. And uh, to be honest with you, the shift in the uh, tech business, in the tech sector, requires innovation that you know, basically taps on everybody's capability and talent. So how are you going to tap that talent unless you're including them anywhere from the exec room to the boardrooms and making sure that they actually participate in that action? So uh, I'll take you back uh, a step backwards, which is 
uh, all of us have, our first sponsors in life are our parents. Our parents actually put us first whenever they're doing anything that requires sponsorship of their kids. When you come into the workforce, you also need sponsors. You already have your parents, but you need sponsors in the workforce who like, put you in the exec room, in the boardrooms, and other places. Having skill is good, but it's not sufficient. So at Intel today, what we're doing is we realize the value of sponsorship. Mm -hmm. We realize the value of accountability to that sponsorship. So the way in which we are able to transcend the boundaries of making sure that we get inclusive uh, uh, actions and ownership on the part of leaders and managers is by making sure that that sponsorship is real. Mm. It cannot be that the sponsorship that Damien gets is the one that same sponsorship that Ed needs. I need something different. I might require something different in order for me to reach my aspirations. And that sponsorship is driven by people with position and power. You can have position and have no power and therefore not be able to sponsor nobody. Yep. Mm -hmm. So that's, so the two things I talked about, sponsorship, accountability, and then making sure that you track those two things are very key ingredients to hitting your goals. And that's what we drive at Intel. I think that's a really, really important point, and I hope the audience is catching this. There is, I think we've heard this conversation, this old saying that there's a difference between having a mentor mm -hmm. and having a sponsor. I think in this industry, very particularly for this industry, sponsorship is so vital and key, and Ed, you raised this point. I wanna just sort of dive a little bit deeper in this notion of sponsorship. What a sponsor will do for you, whether it's a sponsor in your own company, or is it a sponsor in your life, or a sponsor in your, in your career trajectory, but a sponsor, the difference between what a sponsor does and what a mentor do. Uh, so I, I wanna just throw that back at right. both of you. R right, let me stick with that for a second, because that's a very key conversation. A sponsor is somebody who can speak for your work. Mm -hmm. They understand what you do, your skills, your strength, mm -hmm. and what you can't do. Mm -hmm. They're the people who speak for you at the coffee room conversation where you're not present. Yeah. They'll say, well, you know, you're thinking about hiring somebody. Have you spoken to Damien or you spoken to Ed? Now, let me tell you the difference between the two in terms of their skill set and what they're able to do. I've observed Ed do this on this project. I think he'll bring this to the table. This is what you need. This is the gap that you need in terms of the leadership that you need to actually fulfill for in this specific project. A sponsor speaks to your skills and your depth of your skills and what you can actually offer. A mentor is somebody who helps you, on the other hand, perhaps fill a gap. Or, you know, you probably, Ed needs to build his social media and needs somebody who's really very strong at that and perhaps can help him go build that pedigree in terms of what they need to go do. A mentor can actually mentor you, somebody who really has the depth in that skill set, help you go close that gap. Completely different from a sponsor, yeah. you know? And if a sponsor is somebody who has position and power. Mm -hmm. They have influence, you know? They can actually go off and make sure that they pivot the conversation. Folks will try to dismiss and say, you know what? Uh, no, don't hire Ed, I, and I worked with him and I, I really don't think he's the right person for that specific job. Well, tell me specifically what gaps he has. And then that conversation will pivot to either specific facts or the lack thereof, which then cements the opportunity mm -hmm. for the sponsor to actually place you at the table. Remember the conversation? You need to be at the table, right. the seat at the table. Yeah. So can I say a sure. couple quick things? Couldn't agree more with everything that, that Ed just said. Um, some, in many cases, you will never know who your sponsor is. Mm -hmm. Like there have been opportunities. I remember I used to work on Wall Street at Goldman Sachs and I got selected to do something and I was like, where did this come from? And I didn't find out until like years later that there was a woman who was a partner, a white woman who was a partner who had taken a liking to some of my work and just as Ed described, had a seat at the table when I wasn't there and advocated for me, right? And so the important thing there is do well when nobody's looking yeah. because somebody is looking, right? That's number one. The other thing I want to make sure we get across here is, you know, there was a Harvard Business Review article, I think it was called Working Smarter, Not Harder, mm -hmm. a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And it, they had some research in there that looked at networks. And they looked at people who are in the top 20% of performers across industries and corporations. And what they found was that those people had really diverse networks. 
not just diverse in terms of skill set, but diverse in terms of gender, diverse in terms of race, ethnicity, and all the different things. And then they double clicked on that and found that in many cases, the people who had the most homogenous networks, regardless of what it was, were underrepresented minorities and women, us in this room right now. And the folks who had the most diverse and were advancing were people who had uh, with people who were in the majority groups. Now, obviously, there are many other things that go into how someone advances. My takeaway would be that as you think about sponsors and mentors, think about a broad group of individuals who can be members of your personal board of directors. Not, I know that we are sometimes very comfortable with folks who are like us, and for good reason, but push outside of that boundary because it makes sense. Damien, you know, you said uh, a buzzword, a word that's a buzz for me, uh, personal board of directors. How many of you in the audience have ever heard of this notion of personal board of direct directors? Raise your hand. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, how many of you have a personal board of director? Okay, that's great. So this idea of a personal board of directors, of, of thinking of, if, of your life is, you think of your life as a valued company, right. who's helping direct, who's helping guide, and, and, right. and I think sponsors and mentors are in critically important, and, and particularly as it, as it, particularly in larger companies or even in smaller companies, having a mentor in the company, but having someone who's actually going to speak up for you, whether you know them or not, is incredibly important. So that's an important takeaway. So I now want to take this conversation and, and really talk about some of the recent reports that have come out uh, earlier this year. Uh, both of you are smiling at me because I'm sure you'll tell me about the numbers at your specific companies. Um, but, um, you know, diversity and inclusion, like there's this surge of diversity and inclusion uh, the conversation, we're seeing chief diversity officers, we're seeing DNI managers, uh, companies have initiatives, their pledges, they're all of these initiatives happening. But recent reports have shown that while there's greater attention, there's a lot of conversation, there's even hires focused on this, that overall the aggregate numbers are actually worse. We've seen in, you know, from, and I'm, I'm, as a black woman, I cannot ignore the statistics sitting here, that the number of black women in the tech ecosystem dropped by 13% between 2007 and 2015. Mm -hmm. We don't see as many black women or people of color um, in executive positions in the C-suites across the industry. So I want to just unpack that give you opportunity to talk about your specific numbers, um, but let's talk about the industry of a whole. So like, what's happening? What do we need to do more of? What's, where is the leak in the pipeline? Mm -hmm. so, so we're seeing all of this energy and this notion of what, I, I, I read an article and someone said, well, there's diversity fatigue. <laughs> so, I mean, is, is that, is, I, it, I don't think there could ever be fatigue uh, when it comes to diversity, but th those, those sort of, words are being put out there. And I think we have to be careful right. when we start to hear words come out like that because that then detracts against any forward momentum mm -hmm. or investments in the work. So I, I want to talk about that a bit. Sure. So the, the, so f let me just give you some, start by giving you some statistics around the tech industry. Now, although um, the population representation of African Americans is actually 14% in the U.S., tech industry is less than 2%. So, and then when you look at the, um, the, uh, the retention around the tech industry and why we're actually losing people, the one main reason is the conversation we just had. People can't see themselves being represented at the top in leadership positions and in boardrooms. And when you start slicing that data by, for example, women of color, uh, the numbers even get worse. Mm -hmm. It's get less than one and a half percent. Mm -hmm. In fact, less than 0.7 percent if you look at uh, the C-suites and the boardrooms. So why is that? The, the reason is, again, for the same grounding reasons that we just had around sponsorship and being able to get people into those seats. It's that simple. If folks don't step up and actually start s sponsoring uh, women of color and African Americans as a wholesome community in terms of their getting into managerial and leadership positions, people will come in, it's just like a merry-go-round. People come in and they exit because they don't see value in anything that they can actually connect to. Mm -hmm. And so 
That's what the uh, industry is really uh, in, enamored with. And, but when you step, take a step back and look at companies like Intel, the reason why we focus on that sponsorship, the accountability around that, is because we know that the leaking pipe is connected to that. Mm. And unless we fix that, you cannot fix the bigger picture, if you will. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I, again, I agree. Um, there isn't a lot that me and his brother don't agree on, actually. Um, <laughs> but so this is a really complex problem. Um, and one of the things that when I started at eBay, one of the things that attracted me when I interviewed with, um, with our CEO was he said, look, I know this doesn't happen in six months. I know it doesn't happen in a year. When you actually start to unpack how in the heck we got here, I'm sorry, I'm fresh off of visiting the museum, um, <laughs> African American history in, in, um, in DC, thanks yeah. to my friend Joteka here. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm full right now, and if you haven't, go check it out, but yes. I didn't really make it past the first floor. I spent two hours there, and if you really start to unpack how long it took for us to get to this point, mm -hmm. while I think we need to continue to move with, with a sense of urgency, we're trying to ourselves unlearn certain behaviors and get other people to unlearn certain behaviors, right? With anything you do, there's two parts to it when it comes to diversity and inclusion. Mm -hmm. There's a structural piece, which is like the processes and policies and, 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 and technology behind it, but then there's a cultural piece. And that is the behavioral aspect of getting people, even when you have a policy or a target and you've changed something, getting people to actually do the thing that they need to do. And that's not just majority groups, it's us as well. And so when we talk about these numbers, first and foremost, I think numbers are only one measurement of progress. There are many other measurements of progress. Take a look at our diversity report. Take a look at their diversity report. We talk about more than just how many black folks we hired year over year. There are many other measurements of progress. That's number one. The second thing is so many companies have focused on just hiring that they forgot to focus on how does it feel when you actually get there. Mm -hmm. And you're the first person to actually join an organization. How does it feel when you're the first person to be black in a group of um, white or Asian engineers? How does that actually feel and how are you educating that group to even know that some of the things they may be doing are oblivious, they may be oblivious to it, are alienating another human being, right? So there's a lack of focus, I think, on inclusion. You're seeing more companies focus there. I also think that we've done a disservice when it comes to um, representation and seeing more uh, underrepresented minorities in, in the building. We talk a lot about coding jobs mm -hmm. and we talk a lot about engineering and tech and like that's dope, I get it, we should. But at most tech companies, 50% at least of the jobs are non-tech. When I talk to my friends from business school who are on Wall Street, who are in the legal field, like they don't even know that there are opportunities that are available for them inside of tech. Very closely related to that as we talk about why the pipeline is leaky is because we're all stealing y'all from each other. <laughs> we got, and not on some like hate or shade, but like right now, our community right now, if you are of color, if you are smart and you have an interest in tech, come on. Like you, you number one draft pick right now. And so you have your pick of options, which is both a blessing, because the other thing that we should focus on is that the opportunities here are about wealth creation mm -hmm. for our community. <clears throat> it's not just about us showing up, it's also about us getting some of the equity in these companies and getting paid and closing that income gap that exists currently in the United States. But even with that, like, I don't know that the denominator is getting bigger of us who are out here. And so we need to do more to actually go to the legal industry, go to the financial services industry, tell people that there are opportunities here. And by the way, we also need to do some stuff as companies to stop telling people they have to move to Northern California where five or six barbers might push your hairline back or <laughs> you're, you're living proof. And, or, or, or you don't know where the beauty salon is and they might fry you up. Like, 
it's, <laughs> people don't necessarily want to live in Northern California. So like we could spend 30 minutes alone just focusing mm. on why the pipeline is leaky and why we're not seeing people stay and seeing that number expand. Uh, last thing, sorry, to keep in mind is tech companies are growing. The first tech company I worked at, I won't name that name, it's a great company. When I started, they were at 70,000 people. A Couple years later, they're at 90,000 people. The second tech company I worked for, when I started, they were at 5,000 people. A year later, they were at 10,000 people. So don't always get it twisted. Just because you don't see that percentage growing doesn't mean that the number of black and brown faces you see on a day-to-day -day basis on these company campuses aren't actually growing. So I would just say, you know, dip into those numbers a little bit, understand that there's a structural piece to this, but there's also a behavioral piece. And it actually, and this is not a cop out, it's gonna take us longer than it does to release and launch an app to actually, to handle this. Mm -hmm. Like it's going to be a long-term effort, whether we like it or not. They're very, very important and valid points, is particularly about the hair products. <laughs> I find a hard time trying to find hair products in San Francisco when I'm out here. But Ed, I wanna go to you. Um, right. Damien raised some very valid points as it relates to it takes time, you know, like we, this idea, I think even in politics, like m m my career, I spent a long time in politics, this idea of microwave pot politics, right? You put it in the microwave, pop, 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 and it's here. It's like it takes long, take years. It took years, 15, 10 years, like the civil rights movement. It took years, uh, the growth of, of black leadership, asset managers on Wall Street, years. So uh, anything you wanna add to that? Well, yeah, well, so first of all, um, if you look at the, the options that um, the workforce have today, you look at the advent of the internet, social, so, social media, which actually gives folks the opportunity to pervasively look at different options. People are voting with their feet in terms of where they wanna mm -hmm. be, who they wanna work for, what they wanna do. There's nothing wrong with that. The more options we have as a community, as people who can actually go off and make your choices, the better for you. And in fact, if you look at the bigger picture in terms of uh, black consumerism and how that's really growing, I mean, our purchasing power right now today is $1.2 billion trillion, yep. and that's only gonna grow. Right. That's only gonna grow. So it's projected by 2024, that will be as high as anywhere between 1.5 to $2 trillion. So when people have those kinds of options in terms of purchasing power, don't expect them to be static and sit in one place. They're gonna make their choices, they're gonna pick their place they wanna go, and they're gonna pick their jobs that they wanna do, or where they wanna live. So I think that the dynamic nature in terms of, do people expect change to happen overnight? The answer is no. But is that change going to be favored towards the people with the decisions that can actually make those choices? Absolutely. And so I expect that, like Damien said, over time, this is gonna be a seesaw, but it's a seesaw that's actually moving up in favor mm -hmm. of the purchasing power that the community really has. And I s expect that to continue to actually trend over time. Absolutely, so yeah. we have about five minutes and we're gonna go into questions from the audience, but I, I wanna take this last five minutes and, and ask you two questions. Um, and I always ask this question. Um, I, my, my friends and I will sit around and we'll, we'll sit in a circle and we'll just say, who's next? Um, and, and, and it could be anyone, anywhere. So I'm curious, what's exciting you? Uh, who's exciting you? And what's next um, as it relates to diversity and inclusion in this industry? Well, I had well, there, both of well, them are quiet. That, well, well, the thing <laughs> is that excites me right now because I work in the tech industry and I see that um, all the innovation towards software, hardware, and everything that we do now has facets and components of multicultures in terms of them participating in creating the next wave of the future. And I can tell you that the companies, if you go back 50 years ago and look at companies like Wang Computer that don't exist today, the reason why they don't exist is because they are monolithic. They had this mindset that all innovation can only be done by whites and Asians at the time. That's no longer the case. If you look at the companies today that are striving for survival, you look at all the tech companies, everybody needs folks who are smart, regardless of what your color is. Now, 
Do they want to pay you and keep you the same way that they want to keep others? That's a different conversation altogether. But bottom line is innovation does not happen in a vacuum of diversity. You have to have that diversity of thought in order to drive that innovation. And that's the reality that we're seeing today. I took a deep breath because on one end, I'm like, I'm not, there's nothing that's really exciting me hmm. right now. And then I said, all right, we'll like get beyond that surface level. The things that are exciting me right now are seeing more people of color getting access to capital through different funds that are being raised. Yes. The things that are exciting me right now are seeing our community stop we're no longer allowing other people to be culture vultures mm. and to snatch that our again. culture. That, that's really important. We're, we are, you're seeing a trend where more and more we're waking up and saying, wait, you're getting paid off of me. Yes. Yep. So I'm going to vertically integrate and I'm going to own that decision. You look at Marlon Nichols and what he's yes. doing. Yep. Right? Cross culture. You cross, yes. You look at, at, at many people who are doing that. So access to capital, I think, is major. Um, I, I, I'm really enjoying seeing sisters stand up, you know, and women stand up and say enough, whether it's around uh, discrimination, whether it's around, hey, you have an entire panel and it's focused on women, but there are no women of color here. Like, I'm excited about that. Like, I love it when people stand up and agitate that way. Um, and then, yeah, sure, I think that there are some companies that are doing so. I think our companies are doing cool stuff. The amount of money that this company, that this brother represents, put towards diversity and inclusion, yes. and that was from their CEO, dope. Yes. I think the fact that in our diversity and inclusion report, I referenced Jim Crow and redlining and um, uh, educational inequities. Like, you know, I feel like that's brave for what people are talking about right now. So I think that there are pockets of, of things that folks are doing. You look at Google, for instance, and you know, being a, an HBCU alum and a lover of HBCUs, Google recognized, oh snap, it's not enough for us just to go to Howard and to recruit young brothers and sisters and then have them, many of whom have maybe grown up in all black communities, like since childhood, and then all of a sudden plop them from Washington DC all the way out onto Mountain View and then wonder why maybe it's a bit of a, a, a rocky you know, start. So what did they do? They put their money where their mouth was and they opened a Howard campus on Google's campus to say, let me make this more proximate. I think the thing that we need to see more of that gets to everything that, that we've been talking about today is like, we can't continue to expect folks who don't have our lived experience to just do stuff just because it's the right thing to do or just because they might get in trouble or get blasted publicly. What we need to see more of are opportunities to immerse people in our communities. When I go to Grace Hopper and there are 20,000 women in technology and I bring men and put them in the middle of that room of 20,000 mm -hmm. very talented women in technology, gone are the excuses of we can't find the talent. Yep. And then also when those men come and say, yo, this is, I really realize I'm a man in this room. I'm like, yeah, how do you think the black folks and the women feel at companies in tech all day long? Welcome to it. Like, so I think as human beings, we've got to do more stuff that is less around training, less around uh, classes, and, and th that stuff is good, but like, don't miss the simple essence of making it human and making it proximate, as, as Brian Stevenson <coughs> would say, mm. and getting people closer to the experience that we have. Right, Absolutely. so I think that's gonna be a necessary thing in the forefront. Absolutely, so we now wanna go to some questions. So if you have a question, if you could line up on the two sides, not the middle, if you could line up. And we all learned this very early on that a question ends <laughs> with a question mark. Uh, and if you can keep your questions very brief, we have about 15, you know, we have about 12 minutes for Q&A. So uh, we have a long line of questions, so if you can keep them very brief, and we're going to start, I'm left-handed, so we're going to start uh, on the left side. Thank you guys so much for this conversation. I really appreciate it. Damon, so good to see you. What's up? We used to work together at Google, so MJ. I know the struggles of what you've gone through. So at Tech Connection, we created, I'm the founder of Tech Connection, we created an AI platform that connects diverse talent to tech companies based off of their personality type. And what was fascinating was that for every candidate that we placed, Unbeknownst to us, we're all employers that were dedicated to diversity and inclusion. The ones that were most successful 
had a curated growth plan mm. just for them. Mm -hmm. And it was extremely powerful. I had no idea that this was happening. We mm -hmm. went back, checked in with the candidates, checked in with the managers, and we said, we knew what their strengths were from the beginning. So in their first 90 days, I didn't do an onboarding. I did something that was specific to making sure that those projects that we gave to a candidate was aligned to their strengths so that every day they were practicing what they were naturally good at so that sponsors could see them and see their leadership. So I'm curious to know, like, how do you guys go about creating systematic growth plans that focus on that cultural diversity that candidates have? Because I'm a first gen, I've gone through it, I went through college, my parents had no idea on how to give advice about what was happening at Google. Great, thank There's you. No way so, to that on your own. Growth plan. Uh, how do you go about that? Do you do it? Yeah. So thank you for that question. Yeah. Thanks, MJ. So not specifically in the way you're saying. I don't have. We don't have a growth plan for each individual um, who is at eBay. That's something that I think is more aspirational. What we do do is say that we're not going to just do a bunch of initiatives <sighs> across the world and say, hey, here's the initiative coming out of the DNI office. Go do it. What we've actually done, we have 13 different departments at eBay globally. And so I've worked with uh, our analytics team, with our legal team, and which, with each one of the leaders of each one of those business units to design diversity and inclusion plans that are specific to their department. Within that, we also launched eBay's first diversity and inclusion survey. A lot of companies will throw in a couple of diversity and inclusion questions in like the broader employee engagement survey. We said, no, no, no. We want to get really detailed. So we have 30 questions um, in an annual survey, and then we cut that by gender. We cut that by race and ethnicity. We cut that by age and, and tenure and all those different things. So then what it says is we take the um, uh, quantitative things around um, uh, representation and promotion and attrition, and then we marry that with the qualitative things that come out of that survey to make sure that the efforts within each one of those groups, diversity and inclusion plans, are tailored. So we get to it that way, um, but it isn't as specific as what you're saying. That is longer term and aspirational. Great. Ed, anything you want to add before we go to the next question? Well, uh, I th so the one thing that we have at Intel is that what we know is that uh, people's careers are very dynamic. You know, you set a five-year goal to go and do things, and you know, you'll perhaps meander around the path to get into that goal, and perhaps on, the path, on that way, you probably pivot and do something different. But what we do is we have a dynamic feedback tool that allows us every employee to participate. We call it the warm line. So you can raise, you can raise concerns either about your environment, your manager, your path, whatever the case is, and then that gets fed into the corrective actions that need to go into your growth path and uh, that gets integrated in terms of the conversations you have with your leaders and managers. That's really important to us. Great, thank yeah. you. So if we can keep our questions at 30 seconds or less. No yes, ma'am. Oh, thank you. My name is Shayla Reed. I'm with uh, Dell Technologies. A quick question for both of you. Um, first, I can go with you, uh, Damien. You talked about a little bit of the response to MJ's question. Can you expand about the process you do for promoting within your company so you can see more black leaders within um, the ABA? organization and the same question applies to you with within Intel Ed okay Why don't you go first? yeah so the the leadership uh, pipeline as we manage it at Intel is one where we have a delivery process with accountability built around it to make sure that uh, based on parity based on all other you know gender and diversity uh, breakdowns are we getting the right people a seat at the table like I mentioned earlier on without that conversation being very incisive and very definitive, it then bec it, it becomes a wash. So we put teeth around that mechanism. The leadership pipelines, just as diversity is, every employee at Intel has a contribution to diversity that's 7% of their bonus. In other words, if you don't meet these goals, this is the impact that you actually get. So we put accountability around that. And with that, then you can have a framework that allows you to drive your leadership where it needs to be. Um, so we're not at goals, and we, sh we could have a whole other conversation about that. Um, because of where we are in our journey, that's not where I wanted to start, was with going in with goals. I'm a big supporter of companies who do that, depending on where they are in their journey. Um, what we do do is we look, and we look at the numbers on a regular basis when it comes to promotion um, times. What I would say to you, though, is I'd argue that if that's where you're focused, and I know that that's not where Intel's focus, Intel's focus earlier on, 
But a lot of companies wait until the promotion. They say, oh, crap, this is mess up, messed up. How do we fix it? That's not actually where the issue comes in. The issue comes in in a number one of a couple of places. Either one, who you're hiring. Two, what jobs you're giving those people. In order to get promoted, people around a table have to be able to have an opinion on you, right? And so if you're not being given projects and jobs that are actually high in visibility, then when it comes time for promotion, you can be great, but not enough people will have um, opinions on you. And then the other piece is just straight up bias, where that could happen, whether it's conscious or unconscious. So around that last piece, um, there are a number of things that we're doing and working with external vendors who are experts in looking at performance management processes to put in education um, there. We're also measuring as well. And then on the front piece, when it comes to how we hire and who we hire, there's a number of initiatives that we have around educating both our recruiters and hiring managers, um, and then checking in with folks kind of a, a few months into their experience to make sure that their onboarding process has been positive, but also that they're getting a fair shot at uh, some of the opportunities that will position them for, for promotion. Thank you. Hello, my name is Akela Francis and I work for Street Code Academy. We're actually a nonprofit dedicated to finding the next innovators in technology. And so um, I'm curious because we, what we're building is really a non-traditional tech pipeline and um, I'm interested in understanding what do you see as the potential to access a program like Street Code Academy or a nonprofit who is cultivating this, um, the, the pipeline or uh, potential employees but don't necessarily have that background. Is there some opportunities for um, we supported you guys last year, and we'll continue to. <laughs> Your founder and I go to church together, so um, love what you guys are doing. Awesome, thank you, thank you. Great, great, thank you. And yes, Ed said yes. That's said it. Yes. That's, there are many opportunities <laughs> to support. Awesome. Um, and one of the things that I just want to say, we're finding a hard time with the idea we're Street Code Academy, and so our name often um, attracts really very techie based people, but we're really just looking for diverse talent who can support our students because many of them are uh, people of color, Latinos, black, um, Polynesians in the community. So if you're interested in volunteer opportunities in the Bay Area, find me. Okay. Right. Thank yep. you. Street Code Academy. Yep. Definitely. Thank you. Yeah, I, my name is, uh, my first name is Social Impact and my last name is Hackathon. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I know Intel eBay knows what is Hackathon. And I think uh, we have a pipeline here that we can use to get more um, you know, black folks and underserved community into the tech industry. Myself, I work for Apple, Yahoo, and Salesforce, going through those hackathons, understanding technology and learning. And like you say, Damien, 50% of the jobs in tech, company, tech companies are not just software engineering. And hackathons are not just for building pro uh, tech products. It can be used to build uh, anything, right, any solutions. So my question to you guys is, why can't you guys use an existing event that have been around for 20 years to bring uh, uh, the community into the, the, the tech industry? For instance, there is a hackathon to solve homelessness. <sighs> I've done it in January. There is a hackathon to solve concussion that uh, the Ivy Leagues did. What it does is, it brings anyone from any background to the problem. Right. Yes. So I think we get it. Um, I'm actually in conversations with one of our interns from the summer who's at MIT who uh, led a hackathon that was focused around diversity and inclusion. Like, how about we have a hackathon to tackle diversity and inclusion at large and not just about products? So I think we're both really familiar with hackathons. Absolutely. Um, I think the question is just, um, uh, engaging with the right organization or creating it on our own. So for us, I think it's a, a stay tuned. That conversation is happening right now, but in 100% agreement with you. Absolutely, and, and to be fair, the hackathon space is very pervasive. So you, you know, we, we are involved in so many different areas in that space. It's hard to be involved in everything, but I'm absolutely open to talk to you after the uh, conversation to see what exactly you, you're looking for. Great, thank you. Next question. How's it going? My name is Jazz Bernie. I'm currently a sales engineer at Intel. Oh. So my question is, how do we push uh -oh. young black men forward in such a rigid structure like Intel and eBay? Hmm. Well, um, so first of all, glad to meet you over the conference, you know. Uh, but bottom line is, uh, you know, the thing is about uh, pushing folks through the pipeline. 
is a very deliberate process that needs to happen. Like I said earlier on, the lack of sponsorship is real. And, uh, you know, I speak to a lot of the leaders at Intel. We have conversations around what the pipeline looks like. Uh, those conversations get very real when you start asking for who's sponsoring this specific individual. So the lack of sponsorship that is specific to your interests and needs then l leads to the lagging uh, capability that we actually see. So that's where we're af absolutely focused. And uh, I'll be glad to, again, hook up with you one-on-one -on -one so we can actually talk more about how we're driving that within the company. 10 seconds for me. Sponsorship, couldn't agree more. Yeah. Not just sponsorship from people of color, yeah. mm -hmm. okay? Sponsorship from, from everybody. Everybody, yes. yes. Whoever's right. in a position of power to help you, right. hold on to that. That's number one. Right. But like, that's kind of outsourcing the answer. Yeah. I s never cease to be amazed at how crazy it is to walk through a tech company and to walk down a hallway and to see a brother or sister coming towards me who think that they have the option not to say hello. Mm. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Other people can help with this issue, but like, come on, man. Yeah. Like, like, maybe we weren't born when we had to go to separate bathrooms and sit in different places in a bus, but that wasn't 100 years ago. And I'm gonna start saying that more and more on these kind of panels because we need to be reminded of it. It wasn't 100 years ago, so damn it, like, let's take care of each other. You see a young brother who got some dandruff on his shoulder, go holla at him. You see a sister whose skirt or pants are all messed up, go holla at her. You see somebody going off the rails, like, go holla at him. We need to restore a sense of community outside of the employee resource groups, just regular community that we had back in the day. Right. Absolutely. So we are out of time, but I think it is, that's a perfect note to end on. I think there are so many nuggets in this conversation today. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Damien. I think just some takeaways, if I could just highlight, you know, there's a difference between a mentor and a sponsor. That diversity and inclusion, it's not a buzzword, but actually it is a movement, and it's not gonna happen overnight. That we have to put the human back into the work that we're doing and that it's not just about the data and the analytics and, and the programs and the, and the workshops. That's all important, but how do we put the human factor back into it? And I think finally, Damien, you said it best. If you see a brother or sister in the hallway, All of them. All of say them. hello. Yeah. You know, let's lift each other up as a, as a community. That is what it is going to take for us to grow and to continue to thrive. Thank you so much. Let's give our panelists a wonderful round of applause. Can we give our moderator a round of Great applause? Moderation. Let's go game talk. <laughs> yes, yeah. go game talk. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Peace, y'all. Right. Thanks.